<laughs> Reagan won't be covered. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, if you saw the video, uh, you might remember this already, but I'm going to share a couple of things to recap from that. Uh, we have this, this is called the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, because we get it from the Latin word Beatus, which means blessed. Okay, that's where we get Beatitudes. It's not like, Everly calls it the Bananitudes, but I don't think it has anything to do with bananas. It has to do with, with being blessed. And that blessing comes when we find approval from God. When he approves of us, that is a life that's blessed. And uh, I mentioned before that in verses 3 and 10 of chapter 5, it says, For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It says it kind of at the beginning of the Beatitudes and near the end of the Beatitudes. So all of this is about the kingdom of heaven. What it's like to be a part of God's rule and his reign, to be a part of his kingdom. We looked last week at being... At the, at the uh, beatitude here of blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven and I liken that to bankruptcy that we are spiritually bankrupt before the Lord we all need a savior we all struggle with sin and selfishness so we're poor in spirit before the Lord uh, and then we're going to move on from here so I'm going to read the whole thing Matthew 5 1 through 12 seeing the crowds he went up on the mountain and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted in Matthew 5, 4. You know, we're people, of, we, don't, we don't like crybabies. Nobody likes whiners. Nobody likes emotionally unstable people. People who cry a lot. I'm not just talking about babies here, okay? Uh, we don't like that. Uh, there's a lot of crying in my household every day. <laughs> um, primarily it comes from our younger children you know when there's a physical hurt you know when somebody fell off their bike or um, you know skinned up their knee from falling out in the backyard or whatever like that and so we, we soothe their physical owies uh, then there's the emotional hurts too that bring tears you know when uh, a sister didn't share with another sister you know, their favorite unicorn stuffed animal or whatever like that, you know. So there's that kind of thing that's going on in my home from time to time. But then there's also the other end of it. Like when, I don't know, the older I get, I just, I find I'm more emotional about stuff, you know. And I can just watch a good commercial that includes family and say, <laughs> you know, I'm just overwhelmed by it. So that happens with Elise and I. When we see a good movie that's moving, or, or a good story, or a good song that we hear, you know, it might move us to tears. So those things go on here. But when we're talking about mourning, we're not just talking about shedding tears in general, okay? The word mourn is different from just crying. I can remember a conversation I had with Eliana when she was, when she was a little girl, and she was crying over something. And it was kind of small, in my opinion. It was pretty big to her at the time, I'm sure. But I remember telling her, hey, honey, there's going to be a lot of things in our world that are worthy of your tears. This isn't one of them. Okay? Save your tears for that which is really important. I don't know if that stuck with you or not. Okay. Of course, you're going to nod right now. <laughs> okay. It matters what we cry over. It matters what our tears come for. 
Uh, it could be regretting poor decisions from the past. It could be sorrow and frustration over a family member struggling with an illness. It could be betrayal from a friend. It could be contention with a family member. It could be a beautiful movie or story or song. It could be tears of joy and pride over one of our children or grandchildren. These are all good reasons for tears, but it isn't the same as mourning over something. Mourning has to do with death, with sorrow, and usually nothing we can do about it. Right? It's happened and there isn't anything I can do to change it. Jesus mourned. Jesus mourned. John 11.35 gives us the shortest verse in the Bible. Anyone know it? Jesus wept. Two words. Okay? Or you can look at Luke 19, verse 41. And when Jesus drew near, near and saw the city, he wept over it. Okay? So Jesus shed tears over things. He wept over things. In John 11, in that passage, it happens to be his good friend Lazarus who had died. And Jesus comes to the tomb. And Mary and Martha are there and many other friends are there. And they're all mourning the loss of this good man, Lazarus. And Jesus wept. I don't know why he wept. Some people think, well, he stayed away on purpose longer, right? He could have gone as soon as he heard the news that his friend was sick, but he delayed a few days before he went. Why did he do that? You know, and then he comes and he weeps. Did he not know he was going to raise him from the dead? I think he knew that already. He was ready to glorify God and show that his father had power over death. So that's not what it is. Uh, why did he weep? Well, maybe it was because the human side of him still felt the loss so much of his good friend Lazarus. Maybe as he looked around and he saw the, the, the sorrow in everyone else's eyes and their bodies that he felt that same sorrow that they did. Maybe he felt sorrow over people's lack of faith. Maybe he felt sorrow over the fact that sin and death ruins people's lives so much as they saw there. But he wept over Lazarus. In Luke 19, Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem. Here's the longer part of that passage, 42 through 44. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that would make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. There's another passage that's like that over in Matthew 23, verses 37 and 38. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. Jesus mourns over the city of Jerusalem. He mourns over the sin, the effects of sin on humanity. He mourns over death, and which was not what God wanted from uh, the beginning in creation. He weeps over Jerusalem, the city of God that had forsaken God, rejecting his word, his prophets, and his ways. Death leaves Lazarus' family in deep sorrow, and sin leaves Jerusalem in desolation. Disciples mourn sin and death. They mourn, first of all, their own sinfulness. Remember uh, the, the Beatitudes say, Blessed are the poor in spirit. So disciples, first of all, mourn our own sinfulness. When someone comes to the Lord and makes Jesus Lord of their life and claims him as Savior, they say, I'm a sinner, and I need you to overcome my sin. Please forgive me. Okay? So it starts with that, that we mourn our own sin in our lives. But disciples also mourn the fallen nature of the world around us here. When disciples see a homeless person sitting on the corner begging for food, they don't think, well, I'm not like that guy. 
Instead, they say, oh, Lord, help that man. Give him some hope. Disciples mourn families who have lost loved ones due to COVID-19. Disciples mourn the lies on both sides of the aisle. I'm not just talking about here and here. Both sides of the political aisle during an election year. We mourn that. Disciples mourn children neglected by parents. Disciples mourn a nation who has aborted more than 60 million unwanted babies since 1973. Disciples mourn the level of foul language and violence and sexuality in the entertainment industry. Disciples mourn a culture that, and I have to speak personally here, I was excited at a, a local place here recently and was talking with some people about, we get to come back to church together on this Sunday. And a person standing by said, well, thank God we can finally go back to church. I mourn that statement that the church and God are treated so small, so unimportant. Disciples mourn our own sin, and we mourn the sin of our world. Now, before you get too depressed, I almost had tears here. <laughs> Before you get too depressed, remember, the Beatitudes speak about hope. They speak about hope. The poor in spirit will receive the kingdom of heaven, we're told in verse 3. And those who mourn, verse 4 says, will be comforted. Okay. So what does this comfort look like for those that mourn their own sin and mourn the sin in our world today? What does that comfort look like? How will the disciple who mourns be comforted? Well, first of all, we need to be reminded that this is godly comfort, which comes from mourning godly things, okay? The promise of comfort is not just for the crowds, it's for his disciples, it's for those that have said, I want to follow you, Jesus, I want to learn from your ways, I want to live according to your ways, okay? Crowds and disciples want different things, they mourn different things. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once wrote, by mourning, Jesus means doing without what the world calls peace and prosperity. He means refusing to be in tune with the world or to accommodate oneself to its standards. Such men mourn for the world, for its guilt, its fate, and its fortune. While the world keeps holiday, they mourn. They see that for all the jollity on board, the ship's beginning to sink. The world dreams of progress, of power, and of the future, but the disciples meditate on the end the last judgment, and the coming of the kingdom. Crowds and disciples mourn different things. Crowds mourn the loss of popularity, while disciples know their commitment to Jesus makes them outsiders already. Crowds mourn the loss of money, but disciples put a higher value on integrity and on their word. Crowds mourn the loss of personal freedom, while disciples know that God is the only one that will truly set them free. Grieving over worldly things produces hopelessness, but grieving over godly things produces life. Look at 2 Corinthians 7, 10 for that. So I ask again, what kind of comfort would we receive as disciples of Jesus? I'm mindful of uh, an older man in the scriptures. You can find his story in Luke chapter 2, verse 25. This guy named Simeon. And Simeon was at the temple... Uh, when Mary and Joseph brought Jesus to the temple to dedicate him there for the first time. And this old man, Simeon, had been waiting his entire life for this moment. Luke 2.25 says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. What does that word consolation mean? What does it mean to console someone? It means to comfort them. He was waiting for the comfort of all of Israel. He was waiting comfort from God. So what would comfort this guy Simeon? Well, Israel had been oppressed for hundreds and hundreds of years by their own sin and by nations around them. They were waiting for the promised Messiah to come and set everything right. They were looking for consolation, looking for comfort. Simeon waited his entire life to feel this comfort come. And that comfort came in the person of Jesus as a little baby, eight days old. Joseph and Mary brought that baby Jesus to the temple. 
And here's what he says. When Simeon sees this baby, verses 29 through 32, he says, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. My eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. He says, my eyes have seen your salvation. He basically says, look, Lord, you can take my life now because I've been comforted because I see your salvation in the person of Jesus. So when Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, he's not saying, hey, everybody who mourns, everybody who cries is going to be comforted. It means some people will receive comfort, some people will not. you got to know the source of comfort to be comforted. The Beatitudes in Luke might help us a little bit here. Luke 6.21 says, Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Talking about a future thing here. So much of our culture is focused on right here and right now. One of the greatest irritations a lot of people around the world have felt during the, the quarantine order was that they had to go without or they've had to wait longer than usual to get what they wanted. One of my favorite things to read on social media is called the Babylon Bee. It's a, it's a satirical uh, look at our world, our politics, and sometimes our churches. On April 1st, they posted this. The, the headline said, U.S. descends into third world hellscape where Amazon delivers in three days instead of two. And it goes on to say, the U.S. has become an absolute hellscape, a terrifying place where you can't always get exactly what you want from Amazon in two days. In fact, experts have reclassified the United States as a third world country now that Amazon delivers uh, only in three days or a week or even longer. It's basically Somalia at this point, said Chris Paulson, an essential oils representative from Washington State. If I can't order something I decided I absolutely need to have on a whim and have it arrive in one to two days, the American dream is dead. <laughs> Similar tribulations and hardships have erupted all across the nation. Many people can't hang out at Starbucks all day and now have to get their artisan coffee beverages exclusively via drive through Many people have had to settle for off-brand bread and milk. One horror story tells that uh, straight out of a sub-Saharan African country, a family in Southern California said they had to order their premium steaks to go and eat them at home like cavemen. <laughs> Remember, this is satire, right? But good satire exaggerates something that a culture holds true. Okay? In our American culture today, we love to have what we want, and we love to have it right away. In contrast, the Bible teaches disciples to be patient, to wait on the Lord's timing. And the Beatitude in, in Luke 6, 21 reminds us not to think simply about the here and now, but to think about the day when the Lord returns and makes everything right again. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Okay? In other words, life is going to be difficult now. But remember, you're looking for the judgment day when he returns and makes everything right. So I'll ask the question one more time now. What kind of comfort is Jesus promising? Not that life is going to be perfect. Not that your mourning will be satisfied and you'll get whatever you want. Not even that someday you'll have replaced whatever it is that you've lost. His promise is that someday your weeping will be, be replaced with laughter. That is a comforting thought. And like a parent consoling a child who just hurt themselves, it'll get better. Somehow the sting of the hurt that we feel isn't quite as bad when we trust our Heavenly Father. So, a few things for us to take away from this passage today. First of all, disciples are people that mourn. We mourn our own sin, our own spiritual bankruptcy before the Lord. We mourn the fallen state of the world around us, and that pushes us to pray continually for both. We need to pray about our own sinfulness. We need to pray about the sin and, and the reap all around us. 
that needs the Lord's attention. So first of all, disciples are those who mourn. Secondly, though, we need to live in this age in light of a promise of the next age, okay, that our mourning will give way to comfort, our weeping will give way to laughter, and this life will give way to eternity. That doesn't mean to ignore what's going on around us today, just because you'll be in heaven someday, but it does mean that right now, living here according to the future without sin, without betrayal, without loss, brings comfort right here and now. I was reminded of a passage from Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4, where John sees a future reality. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. So we live now according to that future promise that there will be no tears no betrayal, no more death because of the Lord. And thirdly, I need to remind us here that God is gracious to you even in your sorrow. Even in your mourning, God is gracious to you. One of the incredibly merciful things about God is that even in grief and in mourning, pain can be used by Him for good. Even in the middle of it. Even mourning or suffering is blessed by the grace of God. Romans 3, 3 through 5 says, Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Why? Knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So even in our mourning and in our suffering, we know that God can use that to bring about hope, which will never disappoint, even in the midst of that. So we are reminded today, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. If you're struggling now, know that someday everything is going to be made right by the Lord. If you're struggling now, know that God can use your suffering to produce character and hope. And that's a complete one. Let's stand and sing your invitation song.